Um, I teach uh, most of my load this semester at the Darrington unit at the prison. And I was asking Dr. Patterson today whether or not uh, the assailant that he mentioned is going to be one of our students. Um, he got a kick out of that, but uh, sort of nervous laughter because who knows, right? <laughs> Might actually happen. Um, I'm going to speak today uh, to, you, to you today about uh, American exceptionalism, um, which is a term that we often hear, especially during uh, presidential campaign seasons, if you're paying attention at all to the primaries, especially to some of the Republican candidates, um, people like Marco Rubio, um, sort of use American exceptionalism to frame their entire personal narrative. Um, you've probably heard uh, Senator Rubio talk about how he's the son of immigrants and that America uh, offers opportunities that nowhere else in the world does, and he, he talks about American exceptionalism all the time in his uh, rhetoric as he's running for office. Um, and you often might hear people say, do you believe in American exceptionalism? And some people will say, well, I believe in exception. I believe in American exceptionalism. Some people say, I don't believe in American exceptionalism. And just that phrase, I believe or I don't believe in American exceptionalism, identifies the idea and the concept as an article of faith. So this is part of what we mean when we say that American exceptionalism is part of a civil religion. The title of my talk today is uh, Glorious Destiny lofty ideal. And that is a phrase that was coined by a man named Isaac Wise. He gave a speech in 1869 where he linked the providential destiny of the United States to that of the Jewish nation. Because Isaac Wise was a Jew who immigrated to the United States in the 1840s uh, from Bohemia and he started Reform Judaism. He's the father of Reform Judaism. Uh, but it's a very interesting turn of, of the phrase, glorious destiny, lofty ideal. Um, the, the, the art that I've included on this, uh, on this slide, does anybody recognize it? You ever been to the United States Capitol and gone into the rotunda and looked up and seen the oculus at the very top? This is the ceiling of the, of the United States Capitol, the rotunda, the, the oculus at the very top. And if you look at this, uh, at this painting, which was completed the same year that the Civil War concluded in 1865, George Washington is seated, exalted in the heavens. And he has his arm raised like this to symbolize sovereignty and power. And you see he's been upraised, he's been, he's been deified like the Roman emperors uh, were deified, like Julius Caesar and Augustus and so forth. And then surrounding him is a group of angels. And if you count the angels, there's 13 angels, each angel representing one of the original 13 states of the Union. And I might note that we are not in one of those original 13 states. Just to my Texan friends, I need to throw that in there. Uh, just, a, just, a, you know, just a little dig. Texans love it when I say that I'm actually from one of the original 13 colonies, and, and Texas was part of New Spain. Uh, when the American Revolution was concluded. That's not, you obviously don't think that's very funny, so I'll just move on now. Um, so let's just, let's just get into this then. Um, where, does this, where does this idea come from? This idea, this American exceptionalism idea, this idea that we are a, a unique nation, that we are God's chosen people, where does it come from? Well, you know, we, can, we can almost trace the idea all the way back to Queen Mary of England in the 15th 1500s. She reigns uh, from 1553 to 1558. If you look at her, she's a very grim-looking woman, and uh, she had reason to be. She was the only surviving child of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon, uh, who was a, a Spaniard. Uh, she came to the throne after the death of her half-brother, Edward VI, who was only 15 years old when he became king. He was real sick, but, uh, so he wasn't long for this world, but Edward VI was a Protestant, and he wanted to make sure that Mary did not succeed him because she was a committed Roman Catholic. So his choice was Lady Jane Grey, which was uh, a relative, a cousin of his. And Lady Dr when he died, Lady Jane Grey became the queen. 
she was 16 years old when she became queen. And she reigned for nine days. It was on the 10th day of her reign that Mary marched an army that she had raised into London and imprisoned Lady Jane Grey in her 16-year-old self into the Tower of London and ultimately had her beheaded at 16 years old. She married, Mary Tudor married, Philip II of Spain. This is the same Philip II that the Philippines are named after. Philip II uh, reigned over the, the, in the height of the Spanish Empire when the Spanish possessed a huge empire in South and Central America and in the Pacific and vast territorial holdings in Europe. Philip II was the most powerful monarch in Europe at the time. And it made Englishmen very nervous because they were afraid that Philip would use his power to overawe the English and also uh, return England to uh, Roman Catholicism. And so in 1554, one year after she was, uh, one year after she took power, there was a coup to try to overturn her. But she was successful in, in, in stopping this coup. And from 1554 until her death, or until not her death, but until she was deposed in 1558, she was very, very suspicious of plotters, so especially Protestant plotters. So it's during this period that she pursues Protestants all across England. And it's under her, under her watch that 300 Protestants are burned at the stake. Several Protestants fled England during this time and were exiles. And this is called the Marian Exile. And these Englishmen, they went to places like, in their exile, they went to places like Basel, Worms, Geneva, Strasbourg, Frankfurt, and Zurich. And they drank deeply from the well of Reformed theology, the magisterial reformers, particularly they were influenced by William Tyndale, who was a translator of the uh, Old and New Testaments into English. William Tyndale was deeply influenced by the covenants in the Old Testament. And he developed a theology of national covenant. He believed that God still related to nations through a national covenant, just as he did with the children of Israel in the Old Testament. And the English Protestants uh, were deeply influenced by Tyndale's uh, doctrine of national covenant. And so chosen nation theology in the English-speaking world, in England, and in Scotland, and in America, arises very powerfully from the Marian exile. And the, and the exiles, when they returned to England in, in the late 1550s and early 1560s, when Elizabeth comes to the throne, they're the forerunners to the Puritans, who will ultimately come to these shores, many of them will, particularly this man, John Winthrop, who brought the first colonists to Massachusetts in 1630. And it's John Winthrop who is the one who says, we shall be as a city upon a hill, which is a phrase that has been quoted by great leaders ever since, particularly John F. Kennedy, who calls America a shining city on a hill in his 1961 inaugural address. Ronald Reagan, who was very fond of using that phrase and citing John Winthrop to call America a city on a hill. And of course, who is the person? Who is the person that originates that phrase? Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. And who does he apply that phrase to? To the church, to, to believers, right? You will be like a city on a hill. He's talking about letting your light shine before men so that they might glorify your Father who's in heaven, right? That's, that's what the whole point of this is. But John Winthrop, he sees that phrase and he uses it and he applies it to the, the colonists in Massachusetts Bay Colony. And this is one of the origins of this idea of American exceptionalism. What exactly is this? What exactly is exceptionalism? What does it mean? That's the $64,000 question. I mean, you know, when we go into this presidential campaign, nobody's going to define exceptionalism. Nobody is. It's one of those terms that everybody is going to think that, you know, everybody understands what it means. But it's a very ambiguous term. And it's a very loaded concept. 
and it's emotionally charged. So what I try to do in the book is I try to show that exceptionalism can mean one of two things. That on the one hand, exceptionalism can have a very theological meaning. And I look at five theological themes in the book that exceptionalism draws from, particularly from the Christian tradition, namely the doctrine of election. Exceptionalism historically has been articulated to mean that America is God's chosen people. Also, that being chosen, that America has been tasked by God to fulfill a divine mandate, a divine commission. And sometimes that commission means to overspread the North American continent. Sometimes that mission means to fulfill the dominion mandate in North America. Sometimes that mission is to democratize uh, the, the peoples in the Philippines or in Puerto Rico or in Cuba during the War of 1898 with Spain. Sometimes that mission is to make the world safe for democracy, like in World War I. Uh, sometimes that mission is to confront communism in a sort of Manichaean cosmic battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Of course, the United States representing the forces of good and the Soviet Union representing the forces of evil. Okay, so there's that. There's also this notion, this third idea, this third theological concept of moral regeneracy, where America is seen as the innocent nation. And we'll talk about that in a second. But, but America is not, like Ronald Reagan says very famously in 1984 in his Republican National Convention speech where he accepts the nomination for the second time. He says, America is not the cause of all the ills in the world. And then fourth, this notion that um, the, the land, the American land is, is actually sacred, that we have a sacred homeland. And then lastly, that we have a glorious past, and a past not only that's glorious, but a past that we need to recover. So these are, these are some of the theological themes that are carried out often whenever exceptionalism is articulated by people. And what I want to say in the book is that these, these theological concepts are hijacked from Christianity, and they're used for nationalistic purposes. And the end result is idolatry. And I'll explain that in a little bit. But exceptionalism doesn't have to carry this heavily theological meaning. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, sort of a, a heresy or an idolatrous uh, nationalism. Exceptionalism can act actually be used. We can actually recover the term, and it can be uh, can give us a model for for Christian civic engagement. So instead of uh, a nation being chosen by God. We can affirm that, indeed, we're blessed by God. This is a nation that's been blessed. I don't think that there's any way that you could ever get around that. I don't think there's any way that you could ever deny that. Also, instead of the, the, the nation being tasked with the divine commission, that, that we're tasked uh, with pursuing justice in the world. And that we, have a, we have a responsibility, just like, just like everybody has a responsibility to seek justice and to champion human dignity and individual rights. Uh, instead of being morally regenerate, we recognize that America is flawed. But America, America is founded on ideals. And we're in a constant pursuit of those ideals, even though we falter and even though we're flawed. We are a nation of sinners, after all. Instead of looking at our land as being sacred, we, we, we have a high view of the dominion mandate. That the land God gives us is for all of us to enjoy and benefit from. And instead of looking back on a glorious past, we realize that we have a checkered past. We have a complicated past. But there's hope for our future. Because Americans have always been oriented toward the future uh, since, since the colonial period. So let me, uh, let me just zoom in on some of these doctrines, these theological assertions in exceptionalism, and then we'll look, at, uh, we'll look at what I call open exceptionalism, this political expression, which I think is helpful for political engagement, and then we'll take some questions. So first, chosenness. Uh, let me just read you a quote from, from Herman Melville, who you, you I'm sure you know is uh, the famous author of Moby Dick. Uh, 
And uh, he also wrote another book called White Jacket in 1850. And this is what he says. We Americans are the peculiar chosen people, the Israel of our time. We bear the ark of the liberties of the world. God has predestinated. Mankind expects great things from our race. <laughs> Long enough have we been skeptics with regard to ourselves and doubted whether indeed the political Messiah has come. He has come in us if we would but give utterance to his promptings. <laughs> really? Are we going to be comfortable with that? Well, this is, this, is, this is national chosenness. It's expressed here in the mid-19th century. You know, and, and national chosenness, especially as it's articulated in the 19th century prior to the Civil War, there's this difference between those who are authentic and those who are the inferior other. Right? Those who are as they said in the 1800s, Native Americans, which meant Anglo-Saxon Americans. And then three other groups that were imposters, who didn't belong, who were not in the chosen. For example, Native Americans. Between 1832 and 1833, Andrew Jackson, who's the president, wants to make a final solution of the Indian problem. And his solution is not to assimilate Indians into the political and social community of America. It is to expel them. And so he expels them from their historic homelands in the South and moves them, as you can see in this map, to Oklahoma and to Kansas and Missouri and places like that. Another group of people that is not of the authentic uh, chosen people would be African Americans, who were forced or enslaved during this time. This map shows the concentration of slaves in 1850. And you can see that in the red, that where, where the most constant, highest concentration of slaves were located. In my own county, in Brazoria County, and uh, down in South Texas, just outside of Houston, 76% of the population in 1860 were enslaved. Enslaved. And then there, were, there is the Hispanic population. If you look at this map, the, the, the land where we sit in Texas, all the way to the Pacific Ocean, uh, what was won to the United States during the Mexican War. And the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which concluded that war in 1848, drew the current boundaries along the Rio Grande River and uh, along the Gila River originally, but then a few years later with the Gadsden Purchase, that, that boundary is, is extended down uh, south a little bit, uh, as you see there in Arizona and New Mexico. So Native Americans were expelled from their homeland, African Americans were enslaved, and Mexicans were conquered. And all three of these groups are going to be seen, especially in the 19th century, and well into the 20th century, as inauthentic, as not part of the... Uh, of the authentic community. Then there's divine commission. John Foster Dulles is the Secretary of State under Dwight Eisenhower. Um, John Foster Dulles is one of the most interesting people, I think, in American history. He comes from an amazing pedigree. On his father's side, uh, the Dulles men were mainline Presbyterian uh, ministers. His father was professor of theism and apologetics at Auburn Theological Seminary. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. His, his uncle was the librarian at Princeton University. His grandfather was a missionary to India. And Dulles' mother's side, the Fosters, they were diplomats. His grandfather was Secretary of State under Benjamin Harrison. His uncle was Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson. So he has this, this amazing pedigree, and he grows up in this, in this mainline Presbyterian home, and he combines... This, this, this idea of America's place in the world with his mainline Presbyterian Christianity. And what, what the product of this combination is that he expresses as Secretary of State is a very pronounced manichaeism, where he sees America as, the, as representing the forces of good in America, engaged in a cosmic battle against the forces of evil represented by the Soviet Union. And this is, you know, the source. Dulles is the source of our activities in Iran, for example, and in Vietnam that will later explode into the 60s and 70s. But John Foster Dulles, 
is deeply influenced by something that we all know as the Great Commission. Let me read you a quote from John Foster Dulles. Jesus told the disciples to go out into all the world and preach the gospel to all the nations. Any nation which bases its institutions on Christian principles cannot be but a dynamic nation. The founders created here a society of material, intellectual, and spiritual richness, the like of which the world has never known. The American people, availed of every opportunity to spread their gospel of freedom, their good news throughout the world. So for Dulles, the good news that we are spreading is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not the message of salvation. It is not about the vicarious atonement of Christ. It is about American-style democracy. And so you see, Dulles hijacks this command of Christ that he gives before his ascension, the Mount of Olives, and applies it to Americans, which, of course, as you know, is, you can see, is quite problematic. Then there's moral innocence. You've heard the term manifest destiny before, I'm sure. Manifest destiny is a term that's coined by a man named John L. O'Sullivan in 1845. John L. O'Sullivan is, is an editor. He's an editor of a very influential journal at the time called the United States Magazine and Democratic Review. And this, this journal is um, sort of animated by um, manifest destiny, this, this notion that God has ordained that America overspread the entire North American continent and take the lands that are, you know, are, are in the way, that haven't been claimed yet, all the way to the Pacific, take the lands uh, that's claimed by Mexico, maybe even expand all the way down into South America. And also, uh, it's, 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 it's our manifest destiny, as O'Sullivan would say, that uh, the United States would possess Canada, and perhaps even that the United States flag would fly from pole to pole. So this is, uh, you know, this is pretty problematic as well. But let me just read you a quote uh, from, from John L. Sullivan. Um, he calls, uh, he calls um, America a new heaven and a new earth. Now, I, said, I thought I had written down the uh, page number, but it looks like I haven't, so I'm going to skip that quote. But he does take my word for it. It's in the book. It's one reason you should buy it. Um, he calls America a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, Ronald Reagan, who uh, was president during the 80s, many of us remember him, uh, finally, he was, he was fond of calling America the last best hope of mankind, which is a loose quote from Abraham Lincoln. He was fond of, uh, of, of calling America the hope of the world, uh, and so forth and so on in his rhetoric. Then there was this idea of the sacred land. This is a, a painting in 1872 from John Gass called American Progress. And uh, the idea here is that Providence had set aside uh, the North American continent specifically for the Americans. Uh, to, not only to possess, but to develop and to civilize. So if you see in this painting, uh, the angel of progress, she has in her hands, it's kind of hard to see, but she has in her hands a telegraph wire. She's holding in her right hand a, a, a book representing education. Behind her all is light and all is activity and industry. And in front of her the darkness is receding. And the, the Native Americans are fleeing in her presence, and so are the wild animals. And, and the, the American pioneers, pioneers are are carrying her light into this dark place. And then the notion of a glorious past. This is a, a Norman Rockwell painting uh, called Freedom from Want, which is inspired by FDR's uh, For Freedom speech, where you know, oftentimes we look to the past for a usable past. We look for the parts of American history that we like because we're pursuing a particular political agenda or a cultural agenda, but we ignore the parts of American history that are painful to us things that we prefer just didn't, didn't exist, and we're concerned mainly with taking back the nation and returning it to its former glory. So these are some problematic things, problematic theologically, uh, where theological uh, you know, principles, theological dogmas, even specific verses in the scriptures are taken and baptized uh, in, in the American flag. That's problematic from a Christian standpoint. That's not something that Christians need to be doing because it undermines the purity of the faith. But how can exceptionalism be recovered? Well, 
In my brief couple of minutes left, let me just say this. That there's a difference between patriotism and nationalism. Being a good patriot means that you're, you're, you're going to champion some of the founding ideals that are expressed in, in something like this document, the Declaration of Independence, in which Thomas Jefferson says that all men are created equal. I mean, this is not just a, an abstract concept. This is something that has defined America since the beginning of the nation. Right? It's not something that we've been perfect at championing, but it is something that Americans have been striving for and pursuing for its entire national career. In patriotism, there's still a place for the Christian prophetic voice. There's an honest appraisal of the past, a pursuit of justice through national self-examination. There's no conflating of Christian theological doc doctrines and with national identity. In this way, the Christian faith need not be held accountable for the sins of the nation. The Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, Washington's Farewell Address, the Gettysburg Address, the Second Inaugural, these documents demonstrate for us what our founding ideals are. They situate America in the family of nations. And to conclude, let me just point to Abraham Lincoln. In 1862, there was a meeting in the White House with Lincoln and some clergy. This is in the height of the Civil War. The war was going bad for the Union in 1862. And one of the clergy members expressed the idea that God, after all, is on our side. And this is what Lincoln said. I don't agree with you. I am not at all concerned about that. I know that the Lord is always on the side of right. But it is my constant anxiety and prayer that I and the nation should be on the Lord's side. This to me is consistent with Joshua 6.13. Joshua is in his camp. He's confronted by someone that he describes as the commander of the host of the Lord. And Joshua, if you recall from the story, he asks who the stranger is. and Are you on our side or are you on, on the enemy's side? You remember what he said? Not on either side. The question is, whose side are we on? Whose side are you on? Are we going to baptize our Christian faith in the American flag and theological nationalism? Or are we going to be true patriots? We will recognize that we have a God-given responsibility to, as Jeremiah said, to rejoice the city, right? To pray for, uh, pray for the, 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 the political society that we live in. But when that political society asks us to abandon our faith and our, you know, our, our loyalty to Christ, we're not going to go that far. We're going to be something like someone like Justin Martyr, who I talk about in my last chapter, who said, we are, we are your most loyal citizens. He said this to the emperor of Rome. He said, we are your most loyal citizens. We pay our taxes. We do our duties. But we will not burn incense to Caesar. That's good citizenship, saying we're your most loyal citizens, but we will only be loyal to the extent that we do not betray our Lord and Master. So thank you very much. And I'd like to open the floor up now for questions, if you have them. All right, if you have questions, <clears throat> raise your hand and I'll come to, you, excuse me, come to you with the mic. We do have a $50 gift card from Lifeway and three copies of Dr. Wilsey's book for the best questions that are asked today. So, who's got the first question? The first question, I think, is right over here. Hi, Dr. Wilsey. I'm Patrick Collins, an MDev student here. My question is, what emphasis do you believe that local churches should do in teaching any form of American exceptionalism if they should? Yeah, yeah. And that's a great question. Um, you know, the, the founding ideals that are expressed in the documents. Let's just take the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. And obviously, that's not a verse in the Bible. But it's consistent with Genesis 1, 26 and 27. God declares that all men are created, all of us are created in his image. And the meaning of that, I mean, all of scripture is animated by that great fact, right? That, that the image of God, we bear the image of God, and part of bearing the image of God means that we have a mandate to fulfill. To fill, to, you know, to fill the earth, to subdue it, to, to you know, be stewards of the creation, right? That's one aspect of it. And, you know, teaching, teaching on the Imago Dei, teaching on the dominion mandate. These are, 
These are good things to teach on. They are consistent with a, with a very important founding ideal that, the, that Americans have, have, have strove to understand and grapple with over the past two plus centuries, two centuries and a half, fought a civil war to understand the meaning of that, right? But it's perfectly consistent with Scripture. What's not consistent with Scripture would be to say, well, God likes us better than he likes other nations. God has chosen us above the other nations. We, we have no revelation that affirms that. The only way we could affirm something like that was if God had spoken, and he hasn't. So in our churches, when we talk about our country, when we talk about our nation, we, we have to stick to what we have been told in the Scriptures. And in, when we try to surmise what, what God might have in store for America, what our future might hold, or what, what past events may have happened, did, did God uh, providentially arrange circumstances in, in, in different places in history? We have to say, maybe, perhaps, but not to speak with certainty about that because we're not told in the scriptures. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Malcolm Yarnell, what is your favorite patriotic hymn, and what is your least favorite patriotic hymn? Uh, well, my favorite patriotic hymn is not an American hymn. Uh, my, my, my favorite patriotic hymn is a British hymn, I Vow to Thee My Country. Are you familiar with that hymn? The first two verses, the, the, the context is World War I is raging. Um, Cecil Spring Rice, who was the, US, American, uh, the British ambassador to America under Theodore Roosevelt's administration, he writes this hymn after he loses his son on the Western Front. The first two stanzas talk about the nation and talk about sacrifice for the cause and all that. But the last verse says, starts off by saying, and there's another country. And it talks about heaven. And, and when, it, when Cecil Spring Rice writes about heaven, he says, you know, her, we, we may not um, count her armies. We may not see her king, right, in this life. But that is our primary loyalty. It's to Christ. Uh, ultimately, everything here will pass away. My least favorite patriotic hymn is America the Beautiful. And the reason why I'm, I'm going to get stoned, I'm sure, for probably a lot of reasons today. Uh, Dr. Blazing, I hope I still have a job. Um, <laughs> but um, America the Beautiful is problematic because... It's laden with German romanticism, right? It's laden with, with an emphasis on feelings, an emphasis on emo emoting about the country. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at the words, um, there, there's, there's language that is uh, you know, uh, meant to convey feeling, and it's almost, you can see the critique of romanticism against rationalism in that song. You can almost hear Rousseau himself belting out the words. Um, you know, looking at the words to that song, it's a purely idealistic imagining of what America is. And it's not even an ideal to strive for. It's an impossible goal, right? So it's a meaningless song, which, of course, romanticism really just leads to meaninglessness because it's like a, it's like a Thomas Kincaid painting. I mean... What is this a, a depiction of? It's a depiction of no place. This is truly utopia. No place, right? It has no meaning. It's just, it's just pretty to look at. It just conveys a, a warm feeling inside. That's it. And to me, I think that, you know, if we're going to express patriotism, it needs to mean something, as well as be not idolatrous. Does that answer your question? Uh, David Norman, thank you for uh, your, your presentation today. I just had a question that may be outside the scope uh, of your thought. Although thank you I'm, for telling me that, because I can always fall back on that. That's a, it's it's easy hedge. Yes, sir. Um, although I'm sure you, you probably have an opinion that, that arises out of it. Pushing against American exceptionalism, my question would be, how does that affect uh, your opinions regarding America's foreign policy? Because obviously... That has shaped it to some degree, whether one is uh, a proponent of American exceptionalism or trying to push back against it. And so I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So you may recall uh, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright under Bill Clinton. She made the statement in the late 90s that America is the indispensable nation. 
Uh, you may, may or may not remember her saying that. Uh, I, I don't believe that America is indispensable. I don't believe that any nation is indispensable. H history has shown us that no nation is indispensable. Nations rise and they fall. Take the British Empire, for example. The British Empire in the 19th century was the world power. No one could challenge the British Empire. Owned a quarter of the world's land. A quarter of the world's population were subjects to Queen Victoria. Britain is a second-rate, third-rate power now. You know, uh, the French say that the British are the Americans' lapdog. Right? So I don't believe that any nation, any political community, any entity is indispensable. I think that that's... It's a pipe dream. It's not realistic, right? Um, however, because of America's position in the world, uh, but because of where we have been in the last century since 1917 when we went to war against Germany with the Allies, America does have a particular position in the world that leads to a special responsibility that we have. And so there is a biblical principle that I think does apply to a certain extent that needs to be thought about and explored. And I'm no, I'm no policymaker. But to whom much is given, much is required. I think is a, is, a, is, a, is a biblical verse, a biblical principle, that in some way applies. Now don't ask me how, because I'm not a politician, I'm not running for office, but I think that, that that deserves thought, and it deserves pondering, and it deserves hashing out in, among policymakers. My name is Sastri Misal, I'm a student here. A comment and a question. You have done a good job of presenting the topic. Thank you. And I'm curious how an American would accept your presentation. And the question is, uh, uh, what led you to discover these thoughts? And what, what led you to ponder yeah. on this? Yeah. Uh, well, it's um, been received favorably so far. I haven't had any rocks thrown at me yet. So uh, that's a good thing. I was, uh, I was blessed. My friend Nathan Finn at Union University wrote a nice review of it at the Gospel Coalition a couple of weeks ago, so that was, that was great. Um, in terms of how I became interested in this, um, I come from a, a long military tradition in my family. My grandfather was a lieutenant colonel in the Army during World War II. My dad was a uh, lieutenant on a destroyer during the Vietnam era, 60s. Um, and going, going way back, we can trace this long military heritage in our family. And that's why I grew up surrounded by this. And I grew up in a very patriotic household. And when I studied in my PhD program, I wanted to explore the notion of Christian America. Was, was America founded as a Christian nation? And, and the argument that I made in my dissertation was that America was not founded as a Christian nation, but it was founded as a nation with religious freedom. And so coming from that project of thinking about the Christian America thesis, the idea of American exceptionalism is entailed in Christian America. And so I thought, well, I'd like to explore this. Um, so when I finished my dissertation, uh, my next project was going to be on American exceptionalism. And um, I was blessed to, uh, to have this book come out. My name is Eugene Garcia. Uh, so I'm the child of illegal immigrant into the US, and so is my wife. Uh, we were both born here in the States. So how do we view as a nation, any nation, but specifically America, how do we view immigration, not necessarily just with the Syrian refugee crisis going on in the world, but any type of immigration, how do we view that through the lens of American exceptionalism, uh, also as believers who don't use American exceptionalism as God has chosen this nation to be the best nation in the world, but that God has given us an opportunity to receive and assist and, and whatever else you may, may take with that. Yeah. Politicians love to say that we're a nation of immigrants, and that's the one place where they're correct. We, we are a nation of immigrants. You're a, ch a child of immigrants. I, I'm a child of immigrants, you know, further back maybe than you, but, but we all, you know, unless, unless we, we are full-blooded Native Americans, we all came from somewhere else. And historically, Americans have seen themselves as a beacon to the world. And luminaries like George Washington and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln and uh, more recently, Ronald Reagan, um, talk about America being this beacon, being the place where you know, people that yearn to be free seek to come. 
Uh, this is actually one of the things I say makes America an exceptional nation in a good sense, in a positive, a helpful sense. So many people are trying to get here. No other country in the world has people all over the world clamoring to get here, right? So, I, you know, if you ask, I'm, again, I'm not a policymaker, right? And I don't, I don't claim to be, I don't seek to be. But that's a principle. That's a principle that Americans have always held dear. It's not a principle that we've always been consistent with. It's a, it's, we, we have uh, done a poor job at moments in our history of applying that principle. But it's a good principle, and it's a right principle to be hospitable, to be welcoming, to uh, uh, have a nation that is uh, welcoming to anyone who would be able to get here and pursue what a Christian would say is God's calling on his or her life. I think that's a good thing. Uh, and worth thinking about in terms of policymaking. Now, I mean, obviously, prudence has to go along with idealism, right? Especially in this day and age. But that's historically been, historically that has been, the way Americans have viewed themselves and their nation, for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we have time for one more question. Dean Siebelhagen. John, so... Um, if we're going to support patriotism over nationalism, mm. from a theological perspective, yeah. if you don't know Jesus, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, patriotism in a sense is impossible. I've lived in South Africa where all men are equal, where we were the nation that was the antithesis to that. I've lived in Central Asia. Everywhere I've been, you can put that up and you can put these principles up, but can you fulfill it without the Holy Spirit, which means that, therefore, do you agree that the only hope for patriotism in America is the church? I, I totally agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, I brought up Justin Martyr at, you know, at the very end of my um, presentation, and um, we have scholars here that know more about Justin Martyr than I do. But one thing that I'm struck by when I read Justin Martyr's first apology, for example, is he presents in his apologetic his defense of the Christian faith, one of the things he does is he explains how the Christians, how the church, as I said, are the most loyal citizens. They are the model citizens. They are the, they are the kind of person that the emperor should, should want to have in his empire. Uh, we pay our taxes. We don't abort our babies, which is interesting. Uh, Athenagoras says that in his embassy, right? We don't abort our babies. They had abortion back then? Yeah, they did, and, and Christians didn't do that. Christians didn't abandon their wives. Christians didn't expose their sick uh, parents and grandparents to the elements when they you know, could no longer care for themselves. Uh, they demonstrated themselves as model citizens, just not only in public, in their public duties, but also in their family lives, in their morals, and the way they pursued righteousness. That's what a real citizen is. That's what a real patriot is, right? A virtuous citizen. And I, I agree with you that, that without the gospel, that that is a goal that is unattainable. And interestingly enough, you know, Alexis de Tocqueville, you know, he writes about this in Democracy in America in 1835 and 1840. He says that the thing that, one of the things that makes Americans so interesting is that they have such a high view of Christianity. And I mean, Tocqueville is writing as a nominal Catholic, right? But he, he observes this among Americans, that they, they don't need the state to tell them to be Christian, or to teach them doctrine, but they are. And in being Christian and in being members of churches, local churches, those local churches are the keys to virtuous citizenry in the local communities. That's what he observes in the 1830s. And so what you just said you know, fits exactly with what uh, Alexis de Tocqueville observes and affirms in his classic work on, uh, on, on America. So yeah. All right. Well, let's thank Dr. Wilsey for joining us and making the trip up from Houston. Hold on. You've got to stay here for a second. Dr. Wilsey is available for your uh, July 4th worship services. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was wrong. Uh, no, that's good. That's good. Um, <clears throat> all right. So we have three books and a $50 Lifeway gift card. So, uh, Dr. Wilsey, you are, you are the adjudicator in this matter. So we're, I'm... Unfortunately, I'm going to be excluding our faculty members from 
discussion. So Dr. Sieberhagen and Dr. Yarnell's questions are excluded okay. from from your uh, from the discussion here. So for the best question that you received after your lecture, we have a copy of the book and the fifty dollar Lifeway gift card. So what was the best question? Well, I think it's going to have to go to my brother that's sitting right over there. Patrick, all right, congratulations. Thank you. Runners up. And then runners up. Two of them. So your um, other two questions well, that you think I, I, fit. Uh, I'm going to be nervous about forgetting somebody, I'm sure. Um, but I think my brother right over here, who's uh, okay. asked the question uh, um, about my background and everything, he, he needs to get one. And then there, w w I'm, I'm going to get in trouble. It's just like church. You know, you're going to forget somebody. That's right. Um, who, who did I forget? Had a question over here. You had a question over here. Okay. The only other two. Well, I mean, David questions. Norman, he, he has a pretty high opinion of himself, so he doesn't he doesn't need a free copy. <laughs> so. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so uh, how about if I <laughs> if I present it to the to the man in the blue shirt over there? <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll bring it to you. So. <laughs> All right. Well, um, despite uh, and maybe maybe because of his uh, jab there, David, um, let's go ahead and thank uh, Dr. Wilsey again for joining us today.